So hi everyone, welcome to the session of our web series, Fireside Chat with Champions. In which we interview global business leaders, asking them crowdsourced questions relevant to the biggest challenge we face today, COVID-19 and its impact on various aspects of business and the way we can steer ourselves in current uncertainties. Today we have a very special guest with us, Kala Tanas. Kala is a co-founder of Future Agro Challenge, a global innovative platform active in over 64 countries across five continents with a mission to unlock new and natural capabilities to feed the growing population and increase the global contribution of agriculture in the GDP. Kala is also co-founder and managing partner of Industry Disruptors, the Game Changer, a non-for-profit organization empowering the youth towards innovation and entrepreneurship in Greece and abroad. She is part of the Global Entrepreneurship Network a TEDx advocate and organizer, and a member of the United Nations Committee of World Food Security, Private Sector Mechanism, and Youth Council Advisor. Kala is a successful entrepreneur with strong social leadership, a citizen of the world with deep intercultural understanding and international experience having lived in three continents, the North America, Middle East, and Europe. Thanks, Kala, for accepting our invitation. I would request you to let our viewers know a bit more about you and your current interest and activities. Floor is to you, Carla. Thank you, Deepak. Um, as you mentioned, we are an organization now in over 64 countries, and really our mission is to find sustainable solutions to the complex food puzzle. Um, it's very challenging times, and I think a lot of what the pandemic has shown is what's coming to the forefront of what we've been, you know, seeking out as a problem for so long. So there's definitely food insecurity, which has been around for some time and now coming to the forefront as well in all global discussions. We look at biodiversity as a huge matter. And of course, climate change that plays a fundamental role in what's going on. Um, there is no doubt that in order to do this, you can't have one or one organization, one person. It needs an ecosystem that comes together and every ecosystem is part of the solution and we only share wish to be part of the global solution as we know we can't handle it all by ourselves. Uh, what we do is we do bring agripreneurs together, farmers, investors, corporates, researchers, and industry experts so that we can join and convene into a global dialogue to show the world that there's other ways that things can happen. We seek out real sustainable solutions. So we really work down at the local level across these 64 countries to really find those you know, new ideas that are happening for the local solution because we really believe that if you want to change a global food supply chain it has to start at the local level as we see now especially with the pandemic that the global food supply chain is hitting in regions where uh, much of that has these long supply chains and these long supply chains are not always beneficial and not always a proven fact of equality around the world so this is as part you know a uh, an initiative that is a non-profit initiative that we wish you know to bring more people on board every day and continue to grow into more nations and to more have more of a local impact around the world awesome so actually like you know FEC, i can myself can vouch for it it's a, such an awesome platform being uh, among few uh, across the world who got selected and getting a opportunity to speak at that forum was awesome so thanks carla for your introduction this brings us to our first question as you know, COVID is unlike anything world has seen so far, at least our generation, and things will be very different post-COVID. You being someone who has been working closely with startups as well as successful entrepreneurs, what according to you will be the impact of COVID on the startup ecosystem and then the subsequent economic downturn? You know, uh, Deepak, we're living in very uncertain times right now. There, the real problem is there's no deadline or time frame for COVID. And because of that, nobody could actually make a strategic cost analysis of what's going to happen. Of course, the second main matter is the lack of global cooperation on this matter. There's been, as you've heard on many political levels, that, that you know each, each region seems to be doing their own thing. And now they're trying to work towards a global solution. Um, we will be seeing major changes in the funding schemes that have been that have led and supported the startup ecosystem. 
we don't know to which extent they will affect you know the funds that have already been out there the grants that have been out there and many startups just to get off their feet need these very basic funds to make the differences they want to do also innovation plays a fundamental role with risk averse investors and this again we're trying we're starting to see a difference investors are no longer going to be at least for the near future as risk averse as they used to be which may slow down the role of innovation that we see. But we will be seeing a big infuse in, you know, taking a look at scale-ups and SMEs to give, you know, some type of stability for the first forefront. Okay. No, I, I fully agree with you that actually even those investors who have already invested in the companies, they would like to give more oxygen to their existing portfolio than looking for uh, new startups. Also, at the same time, when we talk about like, you know, uh, people would like to fund those startups more, which are like, you know, more receptive of profitability than like, you know, getting into uh, the, the trade mill of getting series A, B, C and D. So I think the game is going to be very, very different. Uh, awesome. So great, great uh, insight for our uh, audience. So that brings me to my next question, which is like COVID is already impacting different sectors. If you see that from tourism and Greece is, is like, you know, dependent heavily on tourism and and uh, or or like you know the airline sector which are like you know disrupted by at the same time you find digital economy being like you know close of the town for example if we see that the zoom itself right uh, from a few tens of million of subscribers they are now with hundreds of millions of subscribers so you see that digital uh, organizations are getting some uh, opportunities out of this whole pandemic and while the the, the old school sectors are suffering at the same time, the different countries are being impacted differently. Now, Vietnam, like, you know, believe me, like, you know, I think they will be growing faster than the rest of the world because, first of all, the number of uh, infection is very less. At the same time, a lot of people will move out of China. They would like to go to Vietnam, right, because of whatever Vietnam's government has been doing. So, as you see that actually being associated with food and agriculture sector very, very closely, what, in your view, would be the impact of COVID-19 uh, on businesses in general and food and agriculture sector in particular globally. Okay, let me start with the food and agriculture sector and let's take one step back why this is happening because it plays a fundamental role of where we're going to go as far as businesses. So, of course, since the 1940s, hundreds of microbial pathogens have emerged and as we know, you know, They've come into new territory where we've never seen before. And this has been the effect of HIV, Ebola, and so forth. The majority of them, 60%, originate in the bodies of animals. And most of them, more than two thirds, originate in wildlife. Now, habitat destruction threatens a wild number of wild species, which includes threatening our medicinal plants and animals that we have been dependent on for pharmacopoeia. But the real problem is when you cramp and you ruin, you know, and you, you have this habitat destruction and cramming these species into smaller spaces and increasing them closer to human contact, we're starting to see more and more, and this is going to be happening, that's why they say this pandemic, we'll be seeing more pandemics, is that it really is the fundamental sign of the food supply chain, where intimate contact from these wildlife animals which never had contact in nature with human settlements are now coming into contact with human settlements and this is going to transform over from hum from benign microbes on wildlife animals transforming into deadly human pathogens now it's not only the fact of habitat destruction that you know replacing wildlife habitat habitat with areas you know as large as the size of the african continent but it's how we also raise uh, you know, a large amount of animals for slaughter. Now, when you bring these animals close, even on the factory farm level, and have all these animals packed together you know, next to each other and slaughtering them, this is a, a fundamental starting point to where we're gonna see more and more pandemics coming forward. Now, so that means that the next step to the food and agro, you know, the, the industry is really, really looking into the safe food supply chain at all levels. And this is not only on the industrial level, it also needs to take a look at traditional and cultural levels and how, because you can't change food and what people take 
away from where the traditions and cultures have been for so long. So it's a very complex dialogue that we have here. Um, we're also going to look that there's going to be a big fundamental dialogue, which has been for some time, around smallholder farmers because they're being affected tremendously. We know that we, for so long we need to remove these artificial constraints to domestic trade throughout the food chain in order to link small, smallholder farmers to markets. And we need to reduce the post-harvest loss because that again, food waste comes just from post-harvest loss. And we need to improve the food stocks along the value chain. This, you know, there's going to be some, there already have been some different types of, uh, of uh, schemes that have helped farmer, small farmers especially due to road closures, blockages, and you know, checkpoints that have happened, and the change in the consumption of consumer behaviors. Uh, when we go to businesses, it's really confusing times because while the trend for so long has been around, the, well, so long, the last few years have been about personalized uh, food, uh, personalized foods for your personalized health, and we saw a lot of changes in innovative startups come up around, which were triggering on these large, uh, large um, industries and large companies that have been around, these food brands that have been around and struggling in recent years, how to share their position with these innovative startups. Very much around vegan and uh, you know, meat, new meats coming around and healthy foods. Now we're seeing that these large food brands cannot focus as much on the innovation side as they really, really need to seek into where their food chain to get the food out there as fast as possible because this is what is necessary in order to keep people healthy and keeping the world going with the pandemic situation. So it's very uncertain times. Um, we will see new technologies come out more and more so even from the top level where we're going to connect farmers with markets directly further than just what we see a marketplace. Um, blockchain will play a fundamental role because we're going to need real transparency. So sharing data across all competitive lines. Uh, we need to leverage technology across the supply chain and across all regions because the food supply chain, yes, works on a local level, but it is connected. And if we don't connect all these dots with the, with the, with the effects that technology give us, you know, with the positive outcomes that technology gives us, that we won't be able to move forward. So we really need to work on a reliable transportation infrastructure. We need to um, work really from the bottom up, from the real local level, and have a real collaborative understanding of consumer behavior, of what's happening from the local level all the way up, taking into account cultures and traditions. So that's, that's exactly like, you know, I, I strongly advocate what you're saying. And in fact, an awesome insight which we have given, as you rightly mentioned, that the traceability will become very, very critical because people would like to know from where their food is coming. So 100% I also fully agree with you. And second, as you rightly said, that actually like, you know, the emphasis on the new technologies, whether it is about the digitalization of agriculture, also about like you rightly mentioned about like, you know, the artificial meat. So you 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 will find it like, you know, uh, a lot of companies which are uh, for past five to six years has been working on this uh, like you know cultured artificial meat or plant-based artificial meat right they'll, they'll find a lot of resonance uh, i would also like to add one more area where i i strongly believe that you know in food and agriculture you'll see a lot of things happening is a vertical farming because of people would like to shorten the supply chain like you know the linkages so you would like that you know you grow food as close to as where the demand is so, for example, like, you know, I was very recently interacting with uh, some of the people who are attending the G20 meeting of uh, agriculture ministers, which was, which was like, you know, headed by Saudi Arabia. And majority of the Middle East countries, they are scared that 80% of their food is still coming from outside their uh, own geography. So they have started looking and, and, and thinking about how we can grow at least 40% of our food uh, within our own regions. So I strongly believe in that would be some area where a lot of things would be happening. Uh, so that's uh, that's awesome for, for the insights. So my next question is a little bit about like you know uh, going out of the business and something which is more personal. So COVID is not just a health issue, but it's a social, economical, business as well as a personal crisis for most of us who are like you know interacting with a lot of people, traveling across uh, like you know continents. 
uh, how you and your organization has changed due to COVID and what you are doing to emerge as a better version of yourself in these difficult times. Well, I think like everybody, we're working remotely now. So we're, you know, technology has given us the benefits to make us realize a lot could be done online. Um, as ourselves and as our organization, we believe that the work we are doing on the local level plays a fundamental role of where the future is going. Because like you said, like Saudi, like every other country, they're going to be questioning where their food is coming because of these pandemics and the way the food supply chain still is not as transparent as could be. So if we could bring more and more cases, you know, success stories of what's happening on local and bring that to the forefront, we'll continue to share these stories, we'll continue to bring forward these stories, and most of all, we wanna bring more technologies down to the local level so that we could support these individuals who are trying to find chat the solutions to their own communities challenges because we need to really work on the community level and of course one of the main aspects is really taking a dive into the cultural and traditional aspects that we need to take into our conversation so we will be bringing more and more uh, storytelling around cultures that has a, plays a big fundamental role around the food agro chain awesome so that brings us towards the end of this discussion and uh, yeah, I would like to, because you have interacted with a lot of successful entrepreneurs and you have seen a lot of them failing as well. Running, running such an awesome, uh, I'll say that platform for so many years, right? Every year you have thousands of people reaching out to you, you select you, you tell stories about some of them which are very, very successful like us. And, and uh, so you, you understand what is the DNA, right? That actually like, you know, to be successful. Uh, I would like to understand from you, uh, say three or four silver bullets which you would like to tell a startup entrepreneur who is currently confused that you know what I need to do in, in such a challenging time so based on your experience can you give those four or five um, uh, silver bullets which any entrepreneur should be able to adopt straight away you know uh, Deepak like yourself like every entrepreneur it's not easy being an entrepreneur you know it's really a mindset you have to take on and again, be an entrepreneur and not live a lifestyle of an entrepreneur. So being an entrepreneur is one that will accept that they're going to fail because you will not succeed without failure. And whoever told you that you will must have told you a fairy tale story. Um, it's going to be tricky. And what's most important, I think, for me, what's kept me going is a good sense of humor. I find that all the mistakes that I have made has been the tangent point in where I've had good discussions over my dinner, sharing my experiences, sharing my failures, sharing, you know, my hardships and connecting because at the end of the day, we're all people. We're all people just trying to make a better world out there. So, you know, all people want to know they don't care always about your favorite or best idea or how you're going forward they just want to know you as a story so if you could connect on the person's level and deepak you do that very well connecting with people around the world and you speak to people on all levels just sharing your story is the most important thing and don't be afraid of sharing you know your failures as well because i'm sure you through that failure have learned yourself no, I fully agree. In fact, I, I always, I don't know who has said that, but uh, I love to always quote this, anything which doesn't kill you, make you stronger. So, so yes, we, we have all the entrepreneurs, they have their own uh, failures, uh, big as well as very small. Every day we go through a lot of failures and a lot of successes, right? Uh, and and, and uh, great, uh, I'll say that advice to the all the entrepreneurs, that it's not about the lifestyle of the entrepreneurs, but actually the hardship you go through as an entrepreneur. Uh, it was as usual, usual, like you know, a pleasure talking to you, Carla. Uh, you have been very, very insightful, and uh, keep on doing the great work you are doing. Look forward to participate every year, again and again, uh, with your platform. So APC is awesome. I hope this year you will be doing it uh, mostly virtually. <laughs> so if if, if 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 that's the case, uh, please please uh, let us know, and uh, would like to participate, and uh, uh, look forward to see a huge success with this platform and you as an individual. Thanks a lot for it. It's always a pleasure speaking to you. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>